sizzling human on gay Bigfoot action. Everybody and welcome to episode 64 of the Ron and Brian podcast. I am Ron, as always, joined by the man who is Vince Neal's diet and fitness coach, Brian. Brian, how the hell are you this beautiful uh, July evening? Uh, literally, I am warm. You're if warm? If, if, if your question is, how am I doing? I am warm. The air conditioner in this uh, living room is not on because I want... Uh, pure audio quality. I want you to hear the the nuances of my voice. So therefore, I want no distractions. I don't want you to hear an air conditioner churning in the background. What you will hear are the beads of sweat forming on my forehead, sliding down my temple, coming down my cheek, settling on my on my apple, Adam's apple. You're painting a very erotic picture right now. It's a little early. I'm going to get erotic later on today. <laughs> I'm going to need for you to stop. Okay. Just don't be to- don't be so sexy, Brian. I can't, I can't help it. All right. Well, you know how we like to start things off each and every week. Drink of the week. Nazdrovia. Salud. Drink of the week. Sancho. Pause. Drink of the week, drink of the week, drink of the week. And drink yesterday, week. for those of you that follow that kind of thing, it was National Tequila Day. So in lieu of doing a poll this week, we decided just to do a shot of tequila. Brian, what's your tequila of choice today? Well, as, as you know, Ron, I like to have one bottle per, uh, per, per liquor. So I've got the Jose Cuervo especial blue agave silver tequila oh very nice and i have el gimador tequila blanco also a little blue agave are you drinking it out of your custom ron and brian shot glass you better fucking believe i am (laughs) well i'm gonna i'm gonna just do a quick shot here if you don't mind go for it go for it i think i and one of the things that i've noticed and listeners listeners have uh already commented that we've been doing shots lately we kind of moved away from the cocktail and one of the reasons why and it's one of the some of the feedback we got we'll touch upon it later when we talk about the podcast festival but one of the comments that we've gotten is just how amazing these Ron and Brian shot glasses are. I mean, just a hit right out of the gate. The quality of them, uh, I have to give you credit because this was your project. Uh, the quality, quality second to none. A little frosted glass. Great looking logo on the front there. I'm washing that down. Are you washing that down with Pennsylvania's own Yingling? I do like Yingling. All right. I'm actually going with a little lightweight beer uh, from Germany, a little Schofferhofer. I don't know if you've ever had this, but it's a uh, it's a uh, unfiltered Hefeweizen with grapefruit juice. Mm. Very refreshing. Mm. OK, ah, gets the taste of tequila right out of your mouth. Oh, now, Sorry, um, what made you pick that beer, if I may ask? Um, I was looking for something on the lighter end, and I thought the grapefruit might uh, go well with the, the tequila taste. And uh, I got to say, it was. Okay, there you go. So are we going to are we gonna continue the Drink of the Week poll? Should we encourage people to continue sending in suggestions, or are we just going to keep doing shots moving forward? I'm perfectly fine doing shots. I'm perfectly fine doing dealer's choice. If people do not want to send in um recommendation maybe we just create an environment where we don't even ask him anymore we just put up two things that we want there you go you know maybe it's a matter of taking the power back you know we offered it to the people i mean <laughs> what is the one thing we learned in 2016 people don't go out and vote maybe we're seeing just the same effort of uh, of the demise of democracy maybe there's some type of you know russian collusion that's going on that is dampening down the vote maybe there's facebook advertising saying you don't want to vote on the Ron and Brian podcast drink of the week. Maybe you don't. I don't know. I think, you know, I think Jack Dorsey's against us. Um, you know, much like President Trump, people can't find us on Twitter. People can't follow us. I think the Google is against us. 
You know, there definitely is a conspiracy in all forms of mainstream media against the Ron and Brian podcast. And it's well, sickening I, at times. Can I tell you who I think this conspiracy really starts with? And you know me, I'm not a conspiracy theorist no, whatsoever. No, Where does this start, Brian? Talk to me. Ron Howard, Brian Grazier. Yeah. The they sons have of never been on board. They have never had our backs. They have been at, at, at every step of the way trying to hold us back because they want the Ron and Brian name. They want that, but it's not theirs. It's ours. I mean, people say, you know, why Why is the website ronandbrianpodcast.com? Why is it, you know, why Why is it not ronandbrian.com? And who is right. there to blame, Brian? Ron Howard, Brian Grazier. It's sons of bitches, all of them. So, they literally are squatting on what should be our domain. I mean, think about that. Think about, you know, how the, often have you gone to uh, Ron? How often have you needed Ron Howard news? How often have you needed uh, Brian Frazier news? I can't I, think of a time that anyone has needed that. Did you say um, uh, Brian Frazier? Brian Grazier? I don't know. Oh, See, I thought you said Frazier. I, I can't even tell you what his Down last goes, name is. Down goes Frazier. Down <laughs> goes Frazier. Um, that the 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 part that really bothers me is the fact that when we reached out to their production company uh, about uh, what was it about seven years ago when we were thinking about getting this podcast uh, up and running, we reached out to the production people and said, "Listen, you guys are sitting on this domain. You're not utilizing it. Um, clearly, there's nothing going on in the world of Brian Grazier and Ron Howard. So, can we have the domain?" And you know what they said to us? They That's said off, basically. They they told us to get ronandbrian.net, which yeah. is literally the the double A of the internet. <laughs> no one no one wants that. If if I see a company advertising a dot net right off the bat, I am disregarding any marketing materials that they're that they're putting out there. It's it's a waste of my time. So uh, we had to go Ron and Brian podcast. Dot and, com. Uh, it's 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 a great domain. Don't get me wrong. I love <laughs> it because you know what I like about it is that it says right there in the name what it is. You know what it's you're getting. Ron. It's Brian, and it's a podcast. There's I like no podcasts that have podcasts in the name. I love it. <laughs> we're gonna there are we're gonna people circle out there back. that are that are not fans, but we are huge fans of the name podcast in a podcast title. We're gonna circle back to that. A little bit later. All right. Uh, Ron, what do we got going on this week? Oh, as always, This Week in Racism. This Week in Racism. 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 Brian, we were almost out of the racism game, and then it came back hot and heavy this week. Um, Chris Cooker running up the the numbers on Twitter, a huge number of votes over there. He knocks off the Abington racist 94%. To six percent, almost a clean sweep. He gets win number two. He's going for win number three. Normally, um, we will give you a full list of racists that we considered for this week. But every now and then, you get a candidate that is just so knocking it out of the park with racism, ignorance, and hatred that you just can't consider anybody else. And uh, an all unlikely of places, Raleigh, North Carolina. What? A racist in the South? Believe it or not. Out. At a Get bonefish out. grill, even. I, I mean, I'm surprised there's even a bonefish grill in Raleigh, North Carolina. Didn't think people in the South ate with utensils. Seems That's like a, a good very eating. fancy restaurant. Have you ever done brunch at the bonefish grill? I have never been inside of a bonefish grill. They do a uh, their version of an eggs benedict with a little piece of filet mignon on one and a lobster tail on the other. Really? That actually, that sounds good. I've never been to one. I've always viewed it as the Carabas uh, t- of the uh, Red Lobster world, <laughs> so, where it's 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 in the same ballpark. But you know, we know what they're going for, but they didn't quite succeed. I mean, it's not high end, but it's not low end either. Let's well, put it that way. neither neither is is Red Lobster. <laughs> yeah, I do love those Cheddar Bay biscuits. How would you compare Red Lobster to the Bonefish Grill? I would say it's a step below Bonefish Grill. Really? I, I would I would put Bonefish Grill on a level with like, uh, kind of like you said, a Carabas. I feel Carabas is a step above Olive Garden. 
Okay. Like, I feel Red Lobster and Olive Garden are the same. I think Carrabba's and, and Bonefish Grill give you the, a little bit better quality. Well, when you think about it, the what is what is the thing that everybody talks about at Red, about Red Lobster? And you just it's, did it. It's the biscuits. They don't even talk what is about everybody. What does everybody talk about Olive Garden? The breadsticks. And the and the never ending salad. That's so right. when your claim to fame is the appetizer, is the stuff that gets put on the table before you even order your food, and you're not talking about entrees, that's that to me that speaks volumes about the establishment. It does, but regardless, that's not why we're focusing on Bonefish Grill. Uh, it is because of Shonda Stewart and some of her friends were uh, relaxing after a, a long work day at the happy hour at Bonefish Grill. Um, they happened to be African American. There was a woman by the name of Nancy Goodman, a 71 year old uh, white woman who apparently was upset, felt that Shonda and her friends were being a little bit too loud, uh, mm. confronted them and dropped the uh, the N bomb on them. No. Which uh, they In did, North Carolina? <laughs> they did happen to record, so let's take a listen here. We we never said anything about color. We never said So here's the thing, let me understand. You're too loud. We're too loud. In your opinion. Let me show you my money. It's just as green as yours. Oh, you're so stupid, nigga. Stupid? So first, doing the classic, I have black friends, and then dropping the N-word at them. Um, Now, you would say, Ron, maybe, you know, maybe there's two sides to every story. Maybe the woman provoked her or whatever. Uh, But the local news station caught up with Nancy uh, in the following days. Uh, Nancy, do you think she took responsibility for her actions, Brian? Well, I'm going to say that she probably spent the uh, the period of maybe 24 hours after this incident really holed up in her in her house. You know, um, obviously she lives in a in a you know a single wide trailer, so there really wasn't much space for her to to move around a lot. But she really you know um, reflected uh, inside. She reflected on 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 her actions, on her words, her deeds, things, and I I'm sure she came out there. Uh, you know, uh, with a, a full, just a full apology. Well, first, uh, she blamed, uh, she apparently has anxiety. So oh my God. we all know how debilitating that can be at times. Of course, um, of course. And, and claim that the women, uh, you know, did, did, did victim blaming, claim the women, you know, really pushed her and, and, and amped up her anxiety. Uh, and then she had this to say. I'm not going to say I'm sorry to them because they put, kept pushing at it. So, and that's all I'd really like what to say. What about your use of the N word? I used that word because they forced me into it. Mm. Do you see how that's incredibly offensive? Yes, I do. That's why I said it. I would say it again to them. So, okay. they forced her into using the N word. You know, there's almost something about this that I respect. <laughs> okay. Like the, uh, Go on. I have to hear this one. Okay, now she lost me with the they forced me. Okay, she loses me with the I you know they pushed me into a corner, and um, and and blaming them. I have more respect for someone who just says, "Yep, said it. I'll say it again." I guess there's that. You know, like you know, in, she, in is, that, she is firm in her convictions. In at least you know what you're dealing with, and I've and I've said it before, and I know it's not necessarily a popular opinion. But I would rather bring to the surface people's most ugliest thoughts because at least we could deal with them as opposed to um, pushing them down, hiding them, letting them exist only in the dark secrets that we don't talk about. I would rather this woman say, yes, I use the N-word when I get upset, and yes, I'll use it again. At least I can say this woman's a complete racist. I um, mean, you've, you've got a very interesting um, matchup this week. You have Chris Cooker going for his third win. You know, very, Chris doing, doing that, doing that subtle racism of uh, calling a black man, calling the police on a black man. You know, trying to weaponize the police against uh, a, a black gentleman, um, against someone who I would say unabashedly wears her racism on her sleeve. Says, you know what? 
I said it because it was offensive. I wanted to hurt these individuals, and I would do it again, give them the chance. So see, but she's playing. But she's playing the victim card. Of and that's course. the part that of bothers course. me. Is the is that had she just come out strong and said, "Listen, yes, these you know these people pissed me off. I used this word because I was trying to um, insult them. And you know what? Given the opportunity, I'll say it again." Um, there's a, I, I have respect for that, but she starts off by playing the victim, and that I can't respect. Listen, racists, uh, for the most part, are cowards, so it yes. would make sense that she's victim-blaming. So anyway, go to the Facebook page, go to the Twitter page. Uh, you'll be able to vote on this week in racism. Let us know who the worst person is, whether it's Nancy Goodman or Chris Cooker. Check it out. Vote. Let us know what you think. In the meantime, let's roll on over to Beef of the Week. Brian's Beef of the Week. Brian, if you don't mind if I start off this week, um, my beef is with streaming services and the fact that there's just, there, there's too damn many of them and there's more to come. It's going to get worse. It used to be, it used to be Netflix yep. and then Hulu came on board. Um, crackle. crackle crackle was, around. was one that's still hanging out there um but now so don't forget see so they were gonna be like the all comedy one can't forget them now the individual tv channels are doing you know cbs has streaming um nbc has streaming and you know and now what disney's coming out with their own and it's you know we we've been discussing finally cutting the cord getting rid of cable but when you look at all the individual streaming services that you really need to get these days, are you really saving any money at this point versus what your cable bill is? Well, I mean, do you, that's only under the, on the assumption that you're going to be signing up for all of them. But you almost need to, depending on what you want to watch. I think this is, I, and th- I think this is the opportunity as the consumer to let your money be your vote and sign up for the services you want. Don't sign up for services that you don't need. Like I will not be signing up for the Disney streaming service. Well, I know they own almost everything now. Well, and they have, uh, and especially the Marvel uh, universe is going to be which is, pulled off of Netflix and put on the Disney service. Ron, you just, you're, you're making my case for me. I want to thank you. I want to thank you, Ron, because it's, I don't even have to make my own arguments. You're doing it for me. What a, you're, you truly are a great friend. I was going to have a real in-depth discussion with you on the uh, Marvel Phase 4 that rolled out at San Diego Comic-Con just to see how long it would take for you to fall asleep in, during that discussion. But perhaps we'll save that for off the air. Can you at least explain to me what Natalie Portman as a female Thor, how that is? Because that's the way that that is my understanding based on Internet memes. <laughs> what role, what what this this movie is. I know that uh, Scarlett Johansson's getting her own standalone movie. Right. Black Widow. Um, I know that they're doing another uh, uh, Wakanda. Uh, they're doing Black Panther 2, correct. I know they literally have announced like about five years of Marvel movies. It's 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 a pretty ambitious, not only movies, but um, TV shows that will be on the Disney Plus right. streaming network. Um, so Winter Soldier is... and the Falcon will be on. Okay, stop, um, stop, stop, stop. Tom Middleton gets his stop. own Loki TV series. All right, stop sorry. There. Stop there. I'm sorry. What is... How does Natalie Portman fit into the Thor world? Well, she was obviously in the Thor movies. Um, Did not know that. As a character. Really? How is it that after all of these, I've never heard that Natalie Portman had a role in that? Well, she was in the original Thor, and I believe she was in she was in Dark World, Thor Dark World. And then you saw her a little bit in uh, Marvel, in the, I'm sorry, in Ave- Avengers Infinity War when they go back in time. Was that the movie when she plays the um, ballet dancer with Mila Kunis? Uh, you're thinking of Black Swan. Oh, so close. I get those two mixed up. I'm sorry. <laughs> but anyway, there is, you know, in, in the comic books, um, there is a female Thor. 
the, you so know. is this the male Thor becomes female, or is no. it like another dimension? Thor is a woman. It's 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 the character that Natalie Portman plays in the comic books picks up, you know, the the Thor mantle and becomes Thor. She carries the hammer, becomes Thor. I, I'm simplifying so not, it a bit, but for you, I'm simplifying it. So it's not like the long haired um, Hemsworth guy who just suddenly like walks through a doorway and comes out looking like Natalie Portman. Correct. It's not anything like that. It's not like a completely it's not a freaky characters. Friday type thing right. where they accidentally switch bodies. Nothing like that. Okay. All right. That makes sense. Yep. I appreciate your uh uh you pointing that out to me because it did not make sense to me and I also knew not to investigate in any way. I am also I'm very excited about the Blade reboot. Just going to say that. Blade Runner or Blade Blade the vampire. No, that's Wesley Snipes. It was Wesley Snipes. Now it's the actor whose name I can't say, Maharisha is, Ali or whatever that is. Now is that because can we get Wesley Snipes a role? Because I believe he still <laughs> has some. I believe he still has an outstanding debt to the IRS. I could be wrong. We can look I don't into. Think it. He's fully paid that up. We can look into it. I'm sure he would work for scale at this point. So anyway, I, that's my beef. All these streaming services, just too much. Period. End of story. Brian. What's bothering you this week? Well, I'm going to tell you exactly what's bothering me, and I don't know that you're going to like this. Uh, you never know. All right. Um, fan of the podcast, Chuck Tingle. Tingle, he the man is, who writes his uh, prolific writer, Chuck Tingle. He is my beef of the week. Two-time Hugo Award nominee, Chuck Tingle. He is my beef of the week, Ronald. The man who appeared on the trauma panel... In this past week, San Diego Comic Con. That Chuck Tingle? He is my beef of the week. And why is that? Talk to me. Be because this past uh, week, he came out with his very first lesbian story. Yes. Up to this point, all of his stories have been about um, hot man on man or man on male object action. Or, well, and don't also forget his man on Bigfoot. And Obsession. his man on dinosaur, don't forget that as well. Correct. So this was his first, he finally came out with, an, with a lesbian story. Something for the lady buckaroos, as he likes to say. Well, as I consider myself one of those lady buckaroos, I rushed to Amazon, plunked down my two ninety nine dollars before taxes. I'd like to point out now Amazon's charging me taxes as a New York State resident. So all the money I spend on Amazon, now I'm getting taxed. But that's not my beef. My beef is not internet taxes. It's Chuck Tingle writing, Sentient Lesbian Jet Ski Gets Me Off. Go on. I'm intrigued. Right. I'm not going to lie. Now, this is the way it is described in Amazon. And I'm going to read it, if you don't mind. Please. Because it's going to set the table for you. <laughs> Polly, is, Polly is in need of a vacation, and she hopes that a week on the lake with her girls is enough to push away the bad vibes of a recent breakup. Unfortunately, Polly still cannot seem to relax. After a meta conversation with the author of this book, however, Polly suddenly realizes that she's a character in Chuck Tingle's very first lesbian tingler. That is what he calls his books, Tinglers. Then springs into action with a jet ski rental on the lake, hoping to seize the day. This is where the story takes a turn. Polly quickly finds herself seizing even more than this when the jet ski's vibrations give her an unexpectedly erotic feeling. Oh. Soon enough, Polly and her beautiful sentient vehicle, Limon, are locked in the troughs of passion in a secluded cove, proving that love is real for buckaroos and lady bucks alike. This erotic tale at 4,400 words of sizzling human on lesbian jet ski action and hardcore sentient vehicle love. I mean, it, it sounds like a page turner. Like, based on that marketing, I'm in. I'm in. And for just right. two ninety nine plus tax, I'm sold. A what a waste of my two ninety nine. And I, it's not a Jewish thing. I swear to God, <laughs> it's not a Jewish thing. I want my two ninety nine back, not because it's two ninety nine, but literally because his writing is such garbage. And I'm, I, if you don't mind, can I read a, a section from the book? I mean, I wouldn't stop you. I mean, I did ask Chuck for um, uh, uh, approval for his uh, permission. I haven't received it yet, but I think we're safe, right? <laughs> I think so. All right. 
Um, here, we'll start off with this. Okay. You you want me to touch you, Limon Coos? First off, I've never cooed. I don't know anybody that's ever cooed. And just to clarify, Limon is the jet ski. Is the jet ski. Okay. Yes, I nod, please. The jet ski smiles, teasing me a bit longer as causing the ache within my body to return once more, this time reaching an absolutely unbearable level. Maybe I will, Lamon c- continues playfully. I need you, I beg. Finally, the sentient jet ski has mercy, allowing a single finger to slip inside of my soaking wet pussy. I've been yearning for her touch, but when it finally happens, the sensation is startlingly potent, causing a short grasp of air to escape my lips. I push back into the sand, squirming slightly as the Lamon begins to rub my clit in slow, gentle circles. At first, I have a little trouble relaxing, but as the, move, as the movement of the living jet ski continues, I begin to allow these waves of anxiety to wash away. I'm going to skip ahead a little bit because this is because I want because you have to get to the point where this just becomes utterly fucking ludicrous. And that is where she starts going down on the jet ski. Oh, yes. A human <laughs> goes down on the jet ski. OK. Um, I have to hear this. Uh, Okay, now it's my turn, I tell the jet ski, falling forward and crawling across the sand towards her. It doesn't take long for me to realize, however, that Lamone's pussy will be quite hard to get to, positioned directly on the underside of her body. The sentient jet ski notices my dilemma, playfully smirking a bit as she eases back into the water. Don't worry, Lamone coos. See, it's coo. Like, again, <laughs> it's same. the cooing you have an issue with. It's it, As long as you don't mind taking a quick dip, you'll be fine. It takes me a moment to understand what she's saying, but when it finally hits me, I spring into action. By now, the gorgeous living vehicle is floating out six or seven feet deep, leaving me plenty of room to run to the edge of the lake and dive in. Gazing up from below, I spot Lamone's beautiful jet ski pussy above me. I swim up to it, tilting my head back as I... Oh, hold on. <laughs> Don't stop. I, I know. I, I, my erection is just fading. <laughs> um, as I position myself, seconds later, I'm lapping away at Lamone's clit, dragging my tongue across her as she floats in circles above. I can tell this beautiful jet ski is enjoying my technique. So gradually, I push harder and harder against her with my tongue. This is a woman performing oral sex (laughs) on a jet ski. It's just fucking ludicrous. And my problem, this is literally my problem, is the fact that there's no story here. And you know me, you know, I've talked about it multiple times on the podcast. I like my porn to have a story. I like there to be buildup. I like there to be backstory. I like there to be dialogue, character. I like to see the characters develop, uh, you know, as the movie goes on. This one, literally, a girl shows up, to, you know, with her friends to a lake. Uh, her her friends go into the pool. They rent jet skis. She rents one. She decides to have sex with her jet ski. And literally, end of the story. You loved it. I feel. No, I didn't love oh, it. Oh, all right. I mean, I literally, I I feel I feel like I was my wallet was raped. Maybe by sentient Chuck Tingle. Maybe it's more my speed. You know, I I like the quick, just get to it. So maybe that's who his audience really is. The the people that want, you know, woman on woman machine action and don't want to sit around through a lot of character development, through plot, anything else. Just boom right to it. The very fact that in the Amazon description, they actually feel the need to point out how few words are in this <laughs> because they don't, they know that people are going to complain after they buy it saying, holy shit, this is literally 30 pages long. But people, I mean, he is, he is at the top of the charts on Amazon. People love his tinglers. You know what? I'm going to start writing my own. Not only did he release his second lesbian tingler this week, but he also had another first um, in his first uh, tingler involving trans males. Really? See, I thought you were going to mention his, the book that he just came out with, which is actually on paperback. This is a, a printed book called Handsome Sentient Food Pounds My Butt and Turns Me Gay. Eight Tales of Hot Food. See, I would I would be curious to see if you would be interested in reading his trans male tingler and reviewing that next week. I very well if, if we want to. I mean, at two ninety nine, <laughs> it's the, literally the cup of it's the price of a cup of coffee at Starbucks. It's not the worst thing in the world. 
So you are giving, uh, I, I take it when you review the Tingler on Amazon, you will be giving this a low rating? Yes. He's got, right now, he's got one rating. And what is that rating? Five stars. Five but stars. I believe that that's, yeah, but that's one rating. I'm going <laughs> to. That's about to here. come down. Um, well, you can yeah, re- you can review it later. You can give it a, the one star rating later. No, it's written by Chuck Tingle. The the review is written by Chuck yeah, Tingle under the pseudonym of Amber Whiting. Oh, classic, classic Chuck. So, uh, well, let's move on from our Tingler. Let's move on from our beefs. Let's get into some of the stories we wanted to cover this week. Obviously, there was something huge that happened this week that the nation huge. was completely tuned in on, couldn't turn away from. Of course, I'm referring to uh, our participation in the Philadelphia Podcast Festival. This past Saturday, we were at Tattooed Moms. Um, We opened up the day on Saturday. I mean, I want to be humble, but I have to say that I think we crushed it. It was, I enjoyed it. I think it was a great first live Ron and Brian experience. Uh, Hot crowd that day. Um, not just from the oh. heat outside, but hot crowd. Again, apologies to the people uh, that were not able to make it into the room. Um, you know, we had a certain number that would fit. You know, we, we tried to get them to squeeze as many in as possible. But we will be playing the uh, the live episode once we get a copy of it. So those of you that missed out will have a chance to hear it. And we we spoke to the podcast festival folks, you know, the organizers prior to last weekend, and we said to them, "What are what accommodations are you making for the overflow crowd? Are you go? Will there be a a, a closed circuit, you know, uh, camera room where people downstairs? Can, you know, obviously they're not going to be able to, you know, they're not going to get into the room. Or you know, the the fire marshal is already threatening to shut down tattooed moms." Um, due to capacity issues, you know, can, can we run the live feed down into the downstairs room? Uh, you know, what have you set up? And I was quite surprised when they said uh, that's never happened in the history of us doing podcast festivals at Tattooed Moms. And I said, um, this is the Ron and Brian podcast. You know what you're bringing here. So the room got packed very quickly. Um and then it lit, and I and you, when you and I were were making our way from the backstage area downstairs to the upstairs uh, room where the uh, where we were going to be performing, I mean, to me, it's as a performer, the last thing you want to do is you know spend those those precious last few moments before you hit the stage looking at disappointed faces. Yes, and it literally was one sad face after another after another. These were people who have been looking forward, you know, for the past months to see us, you know, do our thing live. Um, and 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 there was nothing for them, you know, and, and that, you know, I, I'm, you know, the, the 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 podcast folks said, listen, lesson learned. We will not make this mistake last year. Right. So, um, you know, we look forward to potentially being there next year. We've asked for a bigger venue, uh, blew through a ton of merchandise. You know, thanks again to everybody that said, you know, we need uh, we need some mementos from the Ron and Brian show. Oh, you know, we're not going to go home without it. Um, for those of you, we still I, I think we've fulfilled most about, of our. On. Yes. What about what about our, our friend Hans from Denmark who flew in um, for the podcast? He, he spent over 120 American dollars. And keep in mind, I rejected the kroners that he was trying to pay with because <laughs> I don't accept that shit. Um, I made him go to the nearest foreign exchange uh, uh, currency place, and uh, he was able to convert that into uh, uh, American dollars. Came back. He spent over $120. You know, he bought several hats, um, uh, bought a box of shot glasses, um, he said that he's going to be able to go back and put them on the uh, Denmark eBay, or as they like to call it, eBay. And um, he said he was he was going to make a killing off of them. So if you and I said good for you, buddy. If you've been waiting on your Ron and Brian stickers, uh, there will be a bit of a delay while we get more printed. But we do, yep. as always, encourage you to go to ronandbrianpodcast.com 
go to the contact us page, send us your address. We'll be happy to send you stickers once we get them back from the printers. But again, a great festival. Um, thanks to Kevin from the Everything is Awesome podcast for taking care of the audio. And once we have a copy of that episode, we'll be putting it up on Podbean and iTunes and everywhere else uh, for you guys to take a listen. Obviously, the other big thing that happened this week was Robert Mueller testifying in front of Congress. I don't know about you, Brian. I don't have too much to say about it because I feel um, nothing was really accomplished by it at all. What's your take? I think it is a perfect symptom of the world that we're living in, which is that you have people that are looking at the same that the same um, reality and they are seeing what they want to believe. You have liberals that are walking away from the Mueller testimony saying, aha, we now are going to start the impeachment proceedings because what he said was explosive. He said that the president, you know, committed crimes. He said that the president should be, um, you know, uh, uh, if, if the, um, office of the special counsel had ruled that you could indict a sitting president, that he would have uh, moved forward on that path. At the same time, you have got the right that are literally watching the same testimony, the same words, the same tones, the same actions saying, aha, every, just exactly what we, what we said it was going to be no evidence of collusion. Um, you know, uh, and the, the the impeachment talk now. Trump is a free man. This is great. Um, the Democrats couldn't have embarrassed themselves more. Like everybody is looking at everything through their their the, you know the perspective that they're that they uh, their preconceived notions, and they're seeing exactly what they want to see. Right. You know, the a number of the Democrats, you know, tried to go down the road for you know obstruction of justice whereas the republicans seem to focus on anything other than the report focusing on you know the fbi agents focusing on how the investigation came about to begin with i believe right. some hillary emails comments were thrown around um but yeah at the end of the day i don't know that we you know we didn't get any new information that we didn't have at, you know from the Mueller report um, people didn't read the Mueller report, and you know, on top of that, I don't think they watched the testimony. So I don't know that many people's opinions were swayed. Where where are you leaning as far as impeachment at this point, Brian? Whether it should the, be uh, whether it should be gone after or not? It's um, I without having um, uh, enough uh, uh, control of the Senate, it goes nowhere. Right. So the only purpose to do imp impeachment proceedings is for the Democrats to continuously um, pat themselves on the back and um, try to show the uh, that uh, Trump is a terrible president and should not be president. It will go nowhere. The Republicans will see the fact that he can't be impeached as evidence that he's not guilty of anything. And it literally becomes a cinnamon swirl right down the toilet. I think if you want, I think if the Democrats want to guarantee that Trump gets reelected in 2020, I think they push the impeachment issue. I think that I is, oh, yeah. I think that is the only result from that because to your point, you know, all right, let's say, and, and again, there's only, I want to say about 90 uh, Democrats in the house of representatives that are willing to vote on impeachment at this point. So it's 50, 50 out of, how many? Out of you know, what, 200 and some. Oh, okay. So, you know, it's it's 50-50 that the impeachment gets out of the House, and then obviously it's going to be dead on arrival in the Senate because you need two-thirds of the Senate to vote on it. So all you end up doing is giving Donald Trump a win in that case where he can Correct. say, hey, you tried to impeach me, and I was exonerated. You know, he's already, he's already trying to say he's exonerated. Don't give him more ammunition for that. 
where the Democrats Correct. are going to need to hit him on 2020. They're going to need to hit him on the on the promises he made during his initial campaign that he hasn't followed up on. You know, hit him oh, but- on how the tariffs have impacted the farmers, how jobs have continued to fall away in certain industries in these red states and in these uh, in these purple states. You know, that's where they're really going to need to to attack him on. My problem is the fact that you're dealing with a president and a politician and a man who cannot accept any level of blame, any hint of failure, any um, um, uh, myth of um, of disappointment. So if you if you attack him and say, hey, these tariffs are hurting the you know the farmers he's going to say no they're not well he's just going to lie no, those are lies he's they're going to lie not. he's no, going to say farmers, china has farmers paid 16 are doing million great they've in, never in, been in tariffs so well. and i've given that 16 million right to the farmers yes and that is um and i genuinely believe and this is what caused him to get to 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 win in 2016 is that that populace that population is going to sit there and say he's my guy if i have two people to believe i'm going to believe him all right uh, moving on from uh, from Mueller and Donald Trump, uh, we have to talk about close personal friend of Donald Trump, Jeffrey Epstein, uh, who apparently was found uh, injured and curled up in a fetal position in his New York City jail cell uh, yesterday, with uh, some saying that they feel that this may have been uh, an attempt, a suicide attempt on Epstein's part. Um, which would somewhat make sense given the the predicament that he is currently facing. Brian, do you feel that there is anything uh, amiss about this uh, this potential suicide of Jeffrey Epstein? Um, I would be, and this is just kind of the person that I am. I would be hesitant to um, jump to accept that this is a suicide attempt. And. Fortunately, you would be correct, much like the, some of the dark corners of the Internet. We have conspiracy theories popping up already uh, that, you know, because Jeffrey Epstein probably has some incriminating evidence on a number of high powered, wealthy individuals, that this was probably a hit somehow organized within the New York City jail. Uh, and also people pointing fingers at Bill Clinton with the hashtag Clinton body count trending on twitter earlier today why did i say twi- why did i say twitter like that twitter twitter why because you're getting fancy uh, listen you know excuse me governor it's, have you gone on the listen, twitter today there's oh many there's there's just so many times that you can sign an autograph before you start to feel you're better than everyone else it's a valid point you know i mean when we were when you know um i mean I, are are you a little bit of an aristocrat yeah i think so are you a little fancy yeah you know, I mean, at the podcast festival, you sat there and made me deal with all the cash. <laughs> you know, True. you just stood there signing autographs and signing, you know, those uh, those excellent American made baseball caps. Um, you were signing stickers, you were signing magnets. And I was I was negotiating prices with people, you know, uh, but let's not talk about let's that. Not. Let's 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 um, let's get on to the the Clinton uh, body count conspiracy. What is what is the Clinton body count a reference to? May I ask? Because I'm not. I don't spend a lot of time in those dark corners of uh, of the internet. I do spend a lot of time in the dark corners of Pornhub. <laughs> so the Clinton body count refers to a theory um, regarding the number of people that have died uh, within the Clinton circle over the years okay. with a number of individuals um, out on the web claiming that the, the Clintons have arranged for uh, opponents, uh, people that might testify against them, people that might be trying to blackmail them, that they're just having these people off. And, you know, they're, they're definitely, you know, if you look at over the years, you know, the people, not necessarily close to the Clintons, uh, but that connected to the Clintons that have died, you, you, you get the idea that, all right, maybe there's something there. But then right. when you really look deeper into a lot of the individual situations, you find that it's not, you know, there, there's not a lot of substance there. Um, you know, we looked at a website called Conservapedia, 
which shockingly mm. was not the most accurate representation out there. Uh, but they they do list uh, probably between fifty and sixty individuals um, that they claim died due to their connections to the Clinton family. Obviously, the most high-profile one that I think everybody knows about is Vince Foster, uh, who was former White House counsel. He was a colleague of Hillary Clinton at uh, Little Rock's Rose Law Firm, and he died of a gunshot wound to the head um, back on July 20th in 1993, uh, which was ruled a suicide. Everyone said, you know, he had two bullets in the back of his head. So how could it be a suicide? Um, right. And, you know, many of these conspiracy theories claim that the the death was never really investigated. But truth be told, his death was actually investigated three times. And would you like to know one of the individuals that investigated his death, Brian, who that was? Lee Harvey, Lee Harvey Oswald. Not quite. Uh, Ken Starr. Oh, the same, I, why does that name sound familiar? You know, he would be the same special prosecutor um, that uh, led to led the investigation into the Melanica Lewinsky scandal that ended up right. with Bill Clinton getting uh, impeached. So you would think if if Ken Starr had any opportunity to take the Clintons down for Vince Foster's death, he most certainly would have done so. Uh, but even he, after he uh, he investigated it, found out that. Uh, you know, he had no substance about it. When you look deeper into it, you know, and, and Snopes.com does a very good breakdown as to how people really push the narrative of, conser- cons- uh, of conspiracy theories. If someone kills themselves, you know, you don't say they committed suicide. You say their death was ruled a suicide. You know, you you if you play word games, every every death is presented as quote mysterious. Accidental deaths are labeled suspicious. They talk about suspicious plane crashes. Every plane I, crash is suspicious because planes are supposed to stay up in the air. But Ron, do you like you're using Snopes.com as like the barometer of like truth? I mean, who funds Snopes.com? Uh, I mean, I haven't followed the money for that website, but they typically... George so- it's it's George Soros, that, that, <laughs> and that is a fact. Is it? George? Yeah, George Soros funds Snopes so that when the um, when the uh, the Q Anon followers uh, start to pick up the, the breadcrumbs and they go to Snopes to see, you know, what, what's truth or fact, George Soros right off the bat is sitting there saying, this is a lie, this has been debunked, this has been debunked. Why? Because they don't want the truth to come out. Okay. I, I don't know that we can actually prove that George Soros phone, uh, funds Snopes.com. It literally is part of the Trilateral Commission's attempt to keep um, to keep the truth down. I mean, they want uh, they they you know it's 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 the the, the communist or UN that is trying to create a one world government taking away our guns and it's it's you know the um we're waiting for q to uh you know to 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 uh safely continue protecting donald trump he is going to to break the establishment and snopes.com funded clearly by a, a communist jew george soros i mean that is where the that's where the facts are going to go die if people look like and you're a victim of it yourself <laughs> am i you know you're 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 receiving these breadcrumbs and and you're 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 go, you're 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 walking away from the trail because snopes.com says to you this isn't true i mean i i will say i did pull one name off of their list and within 30 seconds of research on google um was able to see that how they told me this individual died did not match up with the reality of the situation. And there are even people on the list of the Clinton death count um, that aren't dead. So I think that hurts some of the credibility (laughs) of the death count. No, wait a second. There's actually people on that list that are alive. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's at least two people on the list. And I am... And see... Also, I, I shared the video where they're also trying to tie... JFK Jr.'s death 
because he was going to run for the the New York uh, State Senate seat that Hillary Clinton was running for. Um, so maybe he didn't, you know, accidentally crash his plane and die. Maybe he was killed off by the Clintons too. So the the, the bigger point that Snopes makes is when you are president of the United States, you have a very large circle of individuals around you. So the odds right. of a circle that large having people that are going to die due to suicide, due to natural causes, due to accidents, increases versus that of the normal everyday person. But I'm in love with this story. I, I, I unfortunately, you know, there, it's not, it's, it's so much, I wasn't able to research it all today, but I'm going to go down all of these individual rabbit holes and, you, and you, we may do just a Clinton body count episode oh, later on this love year. To. The, the peop, you know, listeners who have followed us from the beginning, Ron did some amazing conspiracy uh, internet research on those first couple episodes that we did, where we literally talked for a half an hour, and then we spent the second half an hour on a specific subject. And you truly, I mean, when you put your mind to one single topic, I mean, it's impressive what you come up with. Now, it's very possible I could lose my mind. And I'll be living uh, out of a dumpster, tracking down all of these conspiracies. But that's the risk right. I'm willing to take for you guys. Ron, you're not that far right now that's from true. that point. So it's it's not, uh, I mean, you're literally two cats away from uh, <laughs> appearing on a, uh, on a TV show on the Discovery uh, uh, Animal Channel. Fair enough, fair enough. Uh, what other news happened today? Oh, uh, Attorney General William Barr announced that the Justice Department is going to start using the death penalty again. Um, it had been shelved for a number of years, uh, but the uh, the federal government decided that, you know, we're not happy with, with just killing uh, immigrants and, and migrant children. Uh, we would like to just start killing inmates as well. Yeah, but if these are people that have committed capital crimes, or let me rephrase it, if these are people that have been found guilty of committing capital crimes, like, and, and this is this is something I genuinely believe, okay. which is that... Which is why we're talking li- about it. Which is life in prison for a 20-year-old, is that a worse sentence than execution, you know, quickly after the time of... Uh, of sentencing i would like think if so. i was 25 i if i was 25 and someone said to me we're going to execute you in a year or they said to me you're going to be in prison for the next 85 years get an ass raped on a semi-regular to basis me, to me and mouth rape don't forget about the mouth <laughs> sorry rape. i always forget that, about I, that you know they break your teeth on the you know like the first night you're in jail and then they literally just hand your 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 head around uh, the cell block, um, allegedly, which is why you end up on the floor of the Lower Manhattan um, uh, Detention Center with uh, scuff marks on your neck, um, allegedly. Allegedly. But what I'm saying is the fact that to me the death penalty, in some cases, and the way I look at it, it's actually a quicker way out or an easier way out than life without a chance of parole. My challenge, and, and I agree, there are certain are indivi- certainly are individuals that deserve the death penalty. The, the, the challenge that I have with it is, you know, number one, the number of convictions related to the death penalty that later get overturned for, you know, false evidence, you know, corruption, whatever, you know, if you look at, and Joe Biden tweeted out about this earlier, since 1973, right. over 160 people in this country have been sentenced to death and were later exonerated. I think that's a major issue. And when you look at from a, from a racial perspective, right. how the death penalty is applied uh, to minority convictions versus white convictions you know i i think where i have a big issue with it is all of the issues that are currently going on in the court system just makes it very troubling for me but don't you believe that a lot of the death penalty cases that are being overturned now are ones that took place when there was um a much more antiquated evidence um, uh, system 
there was no DNA testing. True. There was no um, videotapes. There were no surveillance cameras. I mean, I think that people that are being um, sentenced now to death are, I think the percentage of them that are actually guilty are way higher than the percentage of people that were found guilty and sentenced to death in the 1960s. So let me ask you this. Do you feel that the average individual gets a fair shake in our existing court system? No. Okay. I think that, it, and I think Jeffrey Epstein, if we can just bring it back, <laughs> I think he's a perfect case of right. it. No, no, no. It is, and it, I'll even take this back to the argument that you, the famous argument you and I got into about the um, college admissions uh, scandals, which is that if you have money in this society, you are afforded a life that lower income people, regardless of race, do not have the ability to um, ever experience. Jeffrey Epstein has the ability to pay for the best of the best lawyers and have them go up against civil servants in the district attorney's office. So it is no wonder that when you've got um, a, a case like Jeffrey Epstein where he's got Dershowitz and he's got Giuliani and he's got all of these high-powered attorneys that are going into court, they are way better lawyers than the prosecuting attorney. So, which is why, if you have money, you can buy yourself a defense that will most likely get you off or get the um, be able to at least poke enough holes in the prosecutor's case against you that you will get off. Whereas, if you are low income, your defending attorney is automatically going to say, "Let's plead this out," because they're sitting with the caseload. They've got 40 other right. cases to, to 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 get to that day. They're not going to say, let's take this to court and we're going to make the prosecutor's life a living hell. There, there are a number of these cases being handled by public defenders. And to your point, most of the public defenders in this country are overworked, too large of a case Underpa schedule, yes. underpaid. Uh, you know, and and the, the best and the brightest typically aren't going into public defender work because there's no money there. That's just the Correct. truth of it. So the, these, you know, it's another reason I have an issue with the death penalty. Um, NBC News but, has pointed out yes. something interesting, though, and I want to get your take on this because it may be kind of going down uh, a conspiracy theory path. Is, I'm listening. Uh, there are five inmates that the Justice Department says that they plan to execute in the coming months. Four of these five inmates are eligible for the federal death penalty because of anti-crime laws that had been uh, voted on and backed previously by Joe Biden. Either the 1994 anti-crime law sponsored by Biden or the 1988 Anti-Drug Abuse Act, which he voted for. Do you feel that part of this, I mean, I think because I don't, I don't see this move. Oh, I don't see this move just, as appealing to Trump's base. I don't see anyone in Trump's base to make, going after the death this penalty. This is to put Biden. This is to make Biden put him on the hot seat. Exactly. Does that make really? I never thought of does that. Does that That's make genius. more sense to you? Listen, I'm going to say this: the um, the uh, the Trump campaign say whatever you want to say. But they are masters of this game. They, are, they, have, they, they have taken such an unorthodox approach, which is balls to the wall. We don't care. Whatever we have to do, we're going to take whatever help from wherever source we can. But we are going to win at all costs. They have literally made Richard Nixon's attempt to get reelected um, almost seem like child's play. I mean, it seems what they're really doing here is they are giving all of Biden's opponents in the Democratic primaries ammunition to use against him. Genius. Genius. I love it. So do you think they'll televise the executions? No. Really? No. You don't think they'd go no, to that think step? So. No, because I don't... Um, I think Fox News may... They're not going to show the executions, but I could see Fox News making like a three-hour um, live event. I could see them doing but think, that, but think I don't of think this. you're actually going to show. What does Donald, what does Donald Trump them. love more than... love more than Ratings. Right. He loves it more than money. 
He loves and his, his daughter. He loves it more he than his, his daughter, daughter Ivanka. He's not a fan of Tiffany. Gotta love we Ivanka. all know that. She's a beautiful woman. So beautiful. But he loves, but she my he daughter, loves TV but ratings. So, do- so I, I would not ratings. be surprised to see. I wouldn't be surprised to see him pull the switch. All right. Just throwing that out there. Okay. You mean like switches in? If, 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 if it's an election. Sentient, I, got, I got butt pounded by a sentient president. Yes. I, I think that's where I'm going with that. Um, so we'll keep we'll keep an eye. Table. We'll see. Yeah. All right. Again, we'll see if this actually moves forward. We'll find out in the coming months. Um, it's a genius play. I never even thought of that. Yeah, it, it puts Biden in an interesting situation. I mean, he's already come out a couple of days ago and said, you know, he's for eliminating the federal death penalty. But you know, his, his again, kind of like uh, Kamala Harris hit him with his record on on busing in the first debate. You know, and again, it's very interesting timing also because the next round of debates but, is next week. But don't you also think that at some point as a politician, you have to stand up and say, I've changed. I, I'm not the same person I was 30 years ago, and I've changed my thoughts on something. You certainly can say that. The question is whether or not of your voters. society doesn't accept you right, for that. They, 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 They'll reject you. They'll call you a flip-flopper, and you'll be John Kerry. Right. I mean, one, one reason that Trump supporters love him so much is he never apologizes. He never goes right. back and says, I shouldn't have done this. I shouldn't have done that. It's full speed ahead. Um, if, right. But now if, if you can make Biden appear weak by having to change his stance on a number of, of issues that he was, he was steadfast towards in his previous political career, it makes him look right. weak. It makes him look beatable. Well, all right. Interesting. Really interesting. Yeah. I never... Um... Kudos to the uh, to Stephen Miller for that move. <laughs> so I think the only thing we have left here is a, a new little segment uh, that Brian has come up with, uh, oh, calling "Grade the Death." Grade the Death. It's it's a it's a spinoff, if you can say, about the celebrity deaths. And I think uh, regular listeners of the podcast know that I am obsessed with celebrity deaths. You are. I love. I love knowing who's who, who's recently died. I like um, uh, I, taking that as an opportunity to research their life. Ultimately, putting these through a filter question of, do I care? And what I have found is that there's a lot of people that die that I don't care about. And there are some people that really hit hard. Um, uh, the Ghetto Boys Bushwick Bill, that hurt. Um, uh, who else has died recently that really took a toll? Uh, Rip Torn. That one uh, uh, greatly upset me. Um, who else? Uh, uh, my self esteem. When, when when my self esteem died. <laughs> I mean, oof, Jesus. That's I haven't even gotten over that one yet. But there are other times where you know we've talked on the podcast about people dying, and it's just like, oh yeah, blah blah blah. This guy died, and you know, all right, let's move on. So one of the things that I would like to do this week, starting this week, is dis- is bring up a celebrity death. All right. Talk about who that person was shortly. And then you and I assign a grade to that celebrity death, which would um, connotate the level of um, grief that we're going through. All right. For instance, this past week, we lost one of America's greatest musicians, Art Neville, who's the oldest of the Neville brothers, who were a seminal New Orleans band. Art was a fixture of the Louisiana music scene for over 65 years, um, uh, and he died in his home in New Orleans um, at the age of 81. Um, I, most people know uh, Art's younger brother, Aaron, a little bit better, but Art was the patriarch of the family. He was the big chief, a legend from way, way back, you know, um, and frankly, I think he's no better than a C-. minus. Oh, that's a tough one. This is this is my opinion. Art Neville gets a C minus. You know, I I, I know I, I've heard of Aaron Neville. You know, he's got that nasty little bug that that, that flew onto his face and never flew away. <laughs> um, and for some reason, he won't do anything about it. Um, it's really distracting when you see him on TV. But like Art Neville doesn't really do anything for me. When Doctor John died her last month, that was okay. You know, his contributions to the music scene, this one's going to hurt. Well, to put it in comparison, what grade would you have given Dr. John if we were grading deaths at that time? 
I would have to go uh, B minus. Mm, interesting. See, I would give uh, I would give Art Neville a B minus myself. Really, Just... and 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 is that because of your affinity for the New Orleans sound? I mean, I am a fan of the New Orleans sound, and you know, I, I, his his contribution to the family and to the New Orleans sound, I think is pretty big. I understand where you're coming from, but as we learned when you were down this past weekend, we certainly have very different musical tastes. I do not get violently ill uh, listening to the Coffee House uh, channel on Sirius XM Pandora, which clearly... It was maddening. <laughs> it was maddening. Maddening. Oh my God, it was just driving me up the wall. It literally was... Um, uh, it was it was almost as if Tracy Chapman had taken a quaalude, <laughs> and this is what I'm listening to in the morning. Like it was like a slowed down version of like e like every oh it was terrible, just it was <laughs> god awful, and it literally made me anxious. Okay. It made me anxious. However, on the flip side, um, we lost a uh, a movie legend this week. Yes, Rutger Howard. Yes. Now, kids today may may kids today. If I was you know uh, 19. I would give Rutger Hauer a C minus. I'd say, who is he? He was in a bunch of movies in the seventies. Okay, maybe my mom's crying in the kitchen, and I don't know why. But for me, it's a C minus. No, I give uh, uh, Rutger Hauer. I'm going B plus. Are you all right? Why, why, why B plus? Talk to me. He was always the secondary actor. Okay, and I, you know, he he played a great villain, but he was never the lead, and. Um, it was all, he all it was it, his job was to make the other people's job look good you know he, you know in uh in nighthawks he made uh, sylvester stallone look good blade runner he made harrison ford look good um sin city he made um the other guy look good mickey Rourke. yes <laughs> buffy the vampire slayer made uh, sarah michelle galar look good <laughs> galar jackass <laughs> but the point being is just the fact that um he was always the uh the bridesmaid never the bride um that's that's what keeps him from being an a minus in my book. all right i would i would probably go b plus as well uh you i so then why were you why'd you act shocked when i said i, I, b just, plus? I just like giving you shit so uh, God, i don't you you put me on the defensive like that. i like the hitcher i think that was one of my uh favorite movies him and uh c what thomas howell that's where he's like he plays the hitchhiker that c thomas howell doesn't pick up and then he like torments him for the rest of the uh, uh the movie where he's got like uh c thomas howell's like girlfriend tied up to two trucks right. that like pull her apart in the movie really yeah. and then it sounds interesting one of my now is that on a is is that on a, a streaming service uh, <laughs> it might be i'll have to check is, is it one that i pay for is it one that i'm gonna have to go out and and now sign up for a subscription for. And I also remember, uh, do you remember the movie uh, Deadlock? It was like an HBO film he was in, which I think they've renamed Wedlock since then. But uh, it no. was a movie where he was a prisoner in this new type of uh, maximum security prison where all of the inmates, and it's a co-ed prison for some reason whatsoever, um, mm. all of the prisoners have to wear this exploding collar. That's put around everybody's oh. neck. And the reason it's called wedlock is you have, if you're a male prisoner, there is a female prisoner that your collar is connected to, but you don't know who that person is. And if you get any further than 100 yards away from that other collar, your collar explodes and kills you. So the thought process being is that way you won't escape because if you run out of the prison, oh. like if you stay in the prison, you're never more than 100 yards away from Got wherever it. this collar is. So okay. now, of course, the plot ends up being he finds out who his partner is, ends up being Mimi Rogers, and they escape together. Ooh. Oh, I always had a thing for Mimi oh, Rogers yeah. back in the yep. day. So. Oh, my goodness. She made me realize that I was not a homosexual. <laughs> well, that's good to know. When I was a kid. Oh yeah, absolutely. Uh, so that's Rucker yeah. Howard. So that's that's so so. I think that this will give us the ability to um, disagree. And I, you know me, I love disagreeing with you, because one of the things that you and I do that I think needs to be reinforced in society today is to be able to um, not agree on something right. 
and still treat each other humanely, still say, I like you as a human being. I don't agree with you on this one issue, but I'm not going to attack you as a person. I'm not going to think less of you. I'm not going to think differently of you, but we just, we, 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 we love each other, but we disagree. Yes. Can I give you two quick Rucker Hauer facts, which I was not aware of? Sure. Number one, love, uh, uh, he founded the Rucker Hauer Starfish Association, which is an AIDS awareness association. And which is, which is not to be confused with the Father o O'Leary Starfish Club, which was something that we had going on at St. John's uh, uh, Baptist back in uh, the late 70s, where Dr. Father uh, O'Leary would ask you to come in to the rectory, take down your pants, and show him your starfish. He was also, back to Rucker Hauer now, uh, he was also made a knight in the Order of the Netherlands Lion back in 2013. So I guess it was Sir Rucker Hauer. All right. Well, I think well, that's about all we have this week. We touched on a lot. A lot of good stuff going on here. We hope everybody out there was entertained. As always, we invite you to reach out to us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or at the website, ronandbrianpodcast.com. Re- subscribe, rate, review, listen, download, all that good stuff. Um, vote on This Week in Racism. We'll have that poll up on our Facebook and Twitter pages. And we should hopefully be getting our uh, award-winning appearance at the Philadelphia Podcast Festival shortly. And we will be releasing that for your listening enjoyment as well. Anything else for the good of the cause today, Brian? Love you with all my heart, Ronald. Love you more. We're going to roll on out of here. And we will catch you all on the flip side.